Well, hello, everyone, and welcome to my talk on what can Scala learn from Rust. This is a very special talk for me for a couple of reasons. Number one, it's a talk that you chose. Not to point any fingers, but I did a poll on Twitter, and I gave four different options, two of which I wanted to give. I wanted to give the talks, programming is terrible. That was my number one choice, because let's face it, programming is terrible. And we have a lot to learn, I think, about how to write software. But then also, the other one was, what can Rust learn from Scala? Because Scala does some things that are very, very right. And Rust can learn from those things. But what you picked out, you, again, not to point any fingers, is there anyone in the audience who voted for this particular talk? All right, Thomas, okay, there. <laughs> if you don't like it, you blame him. Not my fault. <laughs> so, so, yes, I'm going to be giving you a summary tonight of some of the things that I think Scala can learn from Rust. Okay, so we are here, and first what I'm gonna do is talk about why Scala should learn from Rust. I mean, every programming language has something to learn from every other programming language. But why, in particular, should Scala learn from Rust? And I have a few just key details I think you'll find quite interesting. And then we're gonna take a look at some of Rust's weaknesses, but more in the scope of what can Scala learn about the things that Rust has maybe not gotten quite right. And then finally, we'll take a look at how Scala can learn from what I think are some of Rust's greatest strengths, most impressive features. All right, you ready? Here we go. To set the background, Scala 1.0 was released in 2004. Rust, on the other hand, Rust 1.0 came out in 2015. That's an 11 year gap between those languages. So Scala is a comparatively old and mature language compared to Rust. So everything you see in the next few slides should be interpreted in light of the fact that Rust is the new kid on the block. And any success or adoption it's seen in industry is quite noticeable because it's a baby language in comparison to Scala. So one of the reasons I think that we can learn from Rust in particular is that for whatever reason, Scala developers just seem to like Rust. So this is a Sankey chart I made that has a bunch of made up data. Please don't take this seriously. This is informal, what I would say, where are my friends going to? Where are my Scala friends going to? Obviously, Scala gets new people and, and people leave Scala. And I would say a lot, probably more of my friends go to Rust than any other language. I've got some going to Kotlin, you know, some going back to Java, a few forced to go to Go. A few ascend to heaven and are able to program Haskell, and then the rest is just a smattering of, of this and that. So Scala developers like Rust. In fact, how many of you have either written a hello world in Rust or plan to do that next year? Almost everyone in the audience. So Rust probably has something that this crowd can learn from. And looking at the features of these programming languages, it's not too surprising why Scala developers like Rust. After all, they both have algebraic data types. They both have generics. They both have type classes. They both have macros. They both have associated types, which is a very fancy, fancy feature. It's done differently in both languages, but it helps you write more correct code. They both have pretty powerful collections libraries. They're totally different, but they're very powerful. And they both have, I think, probably the two most mainstream advanced static compilers in existence. 
These compilers are beasts. They can catch tremendous number of potential runtime bugs at compile time. And as a result of that, neither language is simple. Scala is not a, uh, despite the small size of its grammar or whatever you else you want to say about Scala, Scala is not a simple language. It takes a long time to master its very, very powerful type system. And Rust too, you will be banging your head against the wall as you fight the borrow checker and all the error messages that you get out from trying to do things in Rust. They're both complex languages. But that also stands to reason that Scala developers who master implicits and givens and metaprogramming and, and type level programming and higher kinded types and all this other stuff can go over to Rust and, and not have much more than a minor headache <laughs> from wrestling with the Rust compiler. It's more of the same. So Scala and Rust are basically brothers. That's what Dolly thinks they look like. <laughs> Which one Scala do you think? <laughs> well, if they are brothers, then Rust is the hot brother. It's the sideburns, or maybe the crazy hat. But if you take a look right now, there's a tremendous amount of activity in the Rust community. So go ahead, open up your phone or your browser, hop on over to Reddit, the Scal Reddit and the Rust Reddit, and you're gonna see something that just blows my mind, really. You, you know, there's probably 50 people on, over on in the Scala Reddit. And if you all join, that's another 150 or so, probably. And if you go to the Rust one, there's probably gonna be more than 1,000 there, maybe 2,000 there, online, right at this very moment. That's huge. We're talking 20 times more people online right now paying attention. And that Rust feed just scrolls so fast, right? People posting content all the time, new libraries, new events, new conferences, new compiler updates, new this, new that. And that's really reflected in, in news. Right? We have really great newsletters, I think, in Scala, like Scala Times and This Week in Scala and whatnot. And a good week, you know, we'll get four or five things going on. Half of them ZEO, you know, sometimes. Uh, but over in the Rust world, they can't even fit all the stuff that's happening in any given week. Just a tremendous amount of activity in the ecosystem. Rust is super hot. And most importantly, I think, is the fact that the job market for Rust is really gigantic. So Developer Nation did, I think, a fairly reputable survey of full-time salaried employees and asked, or programmers and asked how many of you use Rust. And the number of people using Rust at work is around 2.8 million. That's massive. Now, to be fair, not all of them are using Rust full-time, right? It's, they've got a Rust project or two and they contribute to that, but also they, they've probably got C or C++ or Objective-C or some other lower level systems language, but that's a lot. And Scala doesn't even appear on the chart. My estimate is around 600,000 people professionally use Scala, a lot of them using Scala for Spark, and, and, and not in a major way. The number of people who do like pure backend positions is way smaller than 600,000. So, taking a look at all these figures, the fact that Rust has such tremendous momentum right now and lots and lots of jobs, lots of people using Rust in production. I think Scala has something to learn from Rust. So first we're gonna take a look at what we can learn from Rust's weaknesses. I think this is important. Originally when I put this presentation together, I only looked at Scala's strengths, or sorry, Rust's strengths. And I said, oh, we can learn from this and this and this. But then after thinking about it, I'm like, you know, Rust really screws some things up. <laughs> it does, but it does it in a way that's like, okay, it achieved something, it, it traded something, it made a trade-off there. It gave up something to get something. And so we might look at the overall solution or, or outcome and we might say, you know, that's not great. <laughs> are, are you sure you wanna copy it? 
but also at the same time, it was done deliberately to achieve something else. And so I went back and I incorporated this section. Now this is really, I think, the, the highlight of the presentation is just learning from the things that Rust maybe doesn't get perfectly. And the first one I want to talk about is macros. So I was using Rust macros long before I understood how they worked. And I thought, you know, from the surface area that I saw, I thought, wow, great. I mean, you can trigger macros with an annotation. They're called attributes in Rush, but you can trigger them from an annotation, and they can do amazing things. They can do all the stuff that you could do with annotation macros in Scala 2, right? And then, then some, right? You can do a lot of stuff with Rust macros. And I thought, wow, this stuff is amazing. And then I opened up the engine and peeked inside, and I thought, oh, <laughs> there's a rotting smell in there somewhere. And it's because Rust has unhygienic macros. Unhygienic is academic speak for it sucks. <laughs> Basically what happens is Rust grabs on to a certain part of your code that the macro is attached to, or maybe, well, at the very least, parameters of the macro, maybe, maybe more context than that. And it sends the macro not a nice high-level representation of the code, but a bunch of tokens, less than, greater than, equals, characters, identifiers, and that's what the macro sees. Nothing more than a string of tokens. And then what the macro has to do is generate a stream of tokens in response. Could be any token at all. Could be valid Rust syntax, could be not valid, and could cause compiler errors, right? It's extraordinarily simple and dumb. And all of the, if you look in higher level Rust macros that work at expressions, those things have to take the token stream, parse them into an ADT, an AST that represents the syntax of Rust, lets you do transformations on that, and then they have to pretty print them, just so they can fit into this very, very primitive framework. And right now, this actually, the way Rust does macros and how it should does do macros was the source of some considerable drama in the Rust community not too long ago regarding some keynote. The reality is Rust macros are not great. In some sense, they're not very good, right? They're not, they're not great macros. And switching over, taking a look at Scala's macros, what do we see? We see quotations, splice and quote operators that follow beautiful laws. The splice of a quote is identity. Isn't that amazing? And when you quote something, you get back a typed Expert. The expert is actually typed. And not only that, the macro is entirely hygienic, which means everything has to be valid syntax and all has to type well. Your macro won't even see it unless it's valid Scala syntax and has all the appropriate types. And then when you use that, you end up generating valid code. So it's absolutely beautiful. And it was, I think, inspired by no less than three academic papers, which probably built on even more academic papers. So what you have here is a thing of exquisite beauty, precision. But it's not the entire story, right? Because we've had lots of macros, and this is yet another macro attempt in Scala. And it turns out it's not even the only means of doing metaprogramming in Scala, because we have inlines that can do some stuff that macros can do, but not everything. And then actually, quotation can't solve a lot of problems that we resort to macros for. So Scala invented a new way of doing macros, which is um, reflection. So there's a reflection API that can actually do everything in the quotation API and even more, but in a totally different way. And then we have mirrors, which represent yet another way to do some of the stuff you can do in the reflection API. So we have no less than four different ways of doing metaprogramming in Scala 3, and not even the most powerful of them, reflection, is as powerful as the Rust macro, or as powerful as Scala 2 macros. Right, we're not even back to Scala 2 level of power. Will there be more in the future? Who, who knows, but <laughs> we have something beautiful in the quotation one, truly amazing. 
It took a long time to get there. And we had to throw everything else out of the water to get there. But in, in getting there, we ended up not giving us the power that we need from metaprogramming. And so we had to add other mechanisms of doing the same thing that still to this day are not up to the power of either Rust macros or Scala 2 macros. Another weakness of await async or Rust is await async. So async story in Rust. Some people have called async in Rust a nightmare. <laughs> I won't go so far as to call it a nightmare. It's not a nightmare, okay? Um, but I, I will say this, that fundamentally solving the async problem in Rust is very, very challenging. The Rust language was designed for synchronous code. And its concepts of ownership, for example, or dropping and moving and so forth work very, very well in a synchronous concept. And when you switch over to the world of async, suddenly you're taking what would ordinarily be synchronous code and you're chopping it up into lots of little tiny bits, each of which runs on different threads at different times or maybe not at all. And so a lot of the concepts in Rust don't really fit very well into that. And of course, the Rust compiler team has invested a lot of thought and effort in simplifying this. And, and what they've done to simplify this mostly, I mean, they've done a lot of stuff and they're doing even more stuff now, but one of the major things is they've added syntax, await async syntax. And that removes some of the pain. But syntax is not semantics. And you cannot solve a, a fun, you cannot solve any major problem with syntax and not pay a price for it. And that's because syntax always leaves you with edge cases. And you eventually have to deal with those edge cases and when you deal with them, you have to understand what that syntax actually means. And when you understand what that actually means, you're basically proving that the whole syntactical layer is leaky. It's like a leaky abstraction, except it's not an abstraction. Syntax is never a great way to solve ergonomic problems. Yet, you can ship code with it, right? It, it works, it's getting better. You can get stuff done with Rust async. It's no nightmare at all. In fact, the ordinary common cases are really quite simple and elegant. Scala, on the other hand, has a long history of working on the async problem. We have four comprehensions, which provide us a very lightweight way of embedding call, or rather eliminating callback style with something a lot more elegant and not nested, escaping callback L. Scala standard library incorporated futures at some point. We even got await async syntax for Scala's futures, courtesy of the Lightbend team. And then we've seen dozens and dozens of different library solutions, things like Cat's Effect and Zeo, but also things like, like um, a direct style syntax for monads and tons and tons of different solutions to try to simplify our building of asynchronous software. And then now we have Loom. 2025, we're gonna have maybe Caprese. 2035, maybe we'll have something even better. But I want you to be picturing, as, as you're looking at this, is something good, right? We're, we're on a quest for perfection here, but also something bad. We're on a hamster wheel, and we keep on running and running and running and running and we're trying to get to the end. And maybe there is an end, but maybe there is no end. Maybe we're gonna be on there running. Maybe we just need to pick something and use it, right? And standardize on it. And maybe there should be not constant reinvention of the same wheel. And yes, the reinventions are better, for sure. But at some point, Russ just said, it's good enough, ship it. Let's just make progress, keep on going forward. And then, the last thing I'll talk about is Rust build files. A Rust build file is written in TOML. What's TOML, you say? <laughs> it stands for, what does it stand? Something, other markup language? It's like Tom's, Tom's obvious markup language. <laughs> this is a ridiculous file format for a build, ridiculous. It's a glorified properties file, right? 
key equals value. It's, it has a little more structure than that. But it's kind of a ridiculous format for a build file. And yet, in spite of how, I mean, let's say you want to encode logic in here. There's no way to encode logic. There's no conditional. You can't do a Boolean test here. Let's say you have duplication in your build file. You can't write a function to factor it out. You're just going to be copy-pasting and making the changes. So in, in very obvious ways, this is terrible. <laughs> it's terrible for us who want to abstract. You know, we want, we want to say, no, there's duplication in this part of the build and this part. We're going to factor that out with a function. And oh, we need to build some logic into this build file so we can do x, y, and z. And, and if you keep on going down that path, you end up with Scala, where you can embed anything you want <laughs> into a build file. Your build file is code. And so you can, you can, in this case, this is an actual real build file from Zio. We are loading a file, a YAML file, in the repository, parsing that, getting out a bunch of stuff, and trying to turn that into Scala versions by string matching. Yeah, we can do that. That's the advantage of build files as code. But the disadvantage is we can do that. <laughs> you know how you upgrade your build files, your dependencies in your build file? Regex, search, and replace. That's what all these tools use, right? This build file is not data. And so every tool that has to use SBT build files has to import or synchronize from it, run it to produce something else which is data that it can consume. And so even though the Rust solution is, you know, ridiculously stupid in some ways and very obvious, tremendous drawbacks regarding duplication and logic and all that stuff, you know, it's, it's actually worked out quite nice and supported some of the most amazing tooling ever built for a programming language, which I'll talk about later. So what can we learn from Rust? <laughs> And also, since when has Martin been hitting the gym? <laughs> What's that he's holding? I have questions. Well, inside of every single one of us is two people, OK? There's the mathematician in all of us. And the mathematician, he likes right angles. He likes equations. He likes composability. He hates duplication, abhors duplication. He's always looking for the ultimate answer to everything. He wants those five equations that govern the entire operation of the universe and distill them down to their essence. There's never a problem that he's met that he can't solve with more math, more type theory, more language features, more this, more that. Precision and perfection are the name of his game. And then inside every one of us is also the pragmatist. And the pragmatist doesn't care about math. I mean, unless it's useful. The pragmatist doesn't care about right angles. The pragmatist just wants to solve the job, get it done and ship it. The pragmatist has never met a problem that cannot be solved with a hammer and a big roll of duct tape. Well, what happens when you feed one of these persons inside you and not the other one? Well, they grow more powerful, and they grow more powerful and more powerful, and then they start to dominate the way you write code, the way you design languages, the way you design build tools. So let's imagine for a moment that we have a problem with the, our inner mathematician, maybe overfeeding that inner mathematician. You all are at a Scala conference, not a Go conference, so I know which one you've been overfeeding. <laughs> you look at a loop like this, which sums a bunch of numbers, and you know something's not right with this loop. There's a var in there, nasty. There's a while loop, while loop. Not seen a while loop, have you? Any, any presentation 
over these two days. You've probably never seen a wild oak. I showed you one tonight. And you're like, something's wrong with this. And so you feed that mathematician. And how do you feed it? Well, you're like, I'm going to fold left over that collection. I'm going to delete that wild loop, that nasty wild loop. We're going to delete those nasty mutable variables. We're going to fold left over that. We're going to fold to an int, and we're going to use an accumulator to store the sum, and we're going to compute our sum in that way. Okay, and you've made some improvement to the code, right? This is more beautiful code. It's more precise. It does factor out duplication. Probably has a lower chance of being modified in a detrimental way, right? All the things we know and love about writing FP in Scala. But you don't stop there. No. You love precision and beauty. And so you feed the mathematician more. And what happens? Well. You're like, why am I adding when I could be taking advantage of the fact that ints have a monoidal structure with respect to addition? And why am I folding left when I don't care which direction I should be fold mapping over this? So instead, you map over every element of the collection and you put it into an addition new type, fancy addition new type, so you can activate the monoid, the addition monoid for int as you fold map over all that and then you run it to extract out your final integer. Wow, that feels good, doesn't it? <laughs> we need more. <laughs> we can't stop there. We've got to feed the mathematician. <laughs> and so you feed the mathematician, and you're like, ints are 32 bits, and they overflow. We, 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 can't, we can't work with those. No. Delete the int. We're going to define our own int as a polymorphic function, the way all ints should be defined that takes a tuple of a zero and a successor function and returns repeated application of that successor function to the zero. And then your definition of monoid is beautiful. It's awe-inspiring, isn't it? Look at that monoid. It's a monoid that accomplishes addition through function application. Function composition, actually. Gorgeous. And then, of course, we can't work on collections anymore. Collections are too concrete. We've got to get rid of that. So we're going to go to F. We're going to F everything up. Foldable, I mean. <laughs> and so now our sum works on any foldable and doesn't even mention these wretched things called Scala JVM integers. And we're not done there, right? We've got to feed that inner mathematician more. So we do. We feed it. A crazed look in our eyes emerges. We feed the mathematician as much as possibly as we possibly can, and poof. <laughs> we turn into Martin Odersky and spend millions reinventing Scala with Caprese. <laughs> Sorry, I had to do that. <laughs> in, in all seriousness, we need the mathematician. And we need the pragmatist. If we don't have the mathematician, we end up with Go. <laughs> Not to offend any Go programmers. Go has its, its pluses, but Go is a shitty language, unfortunately. <laughs> we need the mathematician to stop us from going there. And we need the inner pragmatist to stop us to go for going down that rabbit hole that I showed you. That was, that was too far. We need both of them. That's, that's the truth. And Rust has that mixture, I would say, fairly even. Maybe it balances, I think, more towards the side of pragmatism than it does sort of precision and perfection. But Rust does have that mixture. And so one of the things I think we can learn as Scala developers is, yes, we, we do have that inner mathematician. It's OK. All of us have it. I have an especially bad case of it, being a mathematician myself. But we need to balance that mathematician with pragmatism. And Russ shows a way here. Look at all those examples. A way they think, yeah, it gets the job done. Toml is a build file. Say all terrible things about it. They're all true. 
it's probably the best choice, you know, or at least a, a very good choice for a build file format. I would even go so far as to say that no technology succeeds without sucking just enough to disgust our inner mathematician. Think about any example, right? Jason, right? Oh. <laughs> SQL, oh. Go. <laughs> I, I really can't think of anything that's ever been successful that isn't just a little, it sucks a little bit, or sometimes more than a little bit. Winning technology is never perfect. Sorry, Unison. <laughs> This does not bode well for you. <laughs> All right, so let's switch gears now and see if we can learn from some of Rust's strengths. And one of those strengths, I think, is <laughs> compiler errors. So Rust has a whole team that is devoted to making compiler errors really, really good. And there's a huge amount of machinery inside the compiler to propagate information to the right point where they can generate an error message that is useful and actionable. There's even heuristics embedded in there. They do a lot of fancy tricks to make sure that when you can't compile something, you get a very detailed error message explaining what went wrong. It's not always right. <laughs> and when it's not right, it could be very confusing because when it's right, it's very right. And then in addition to explaining what's wrong, I was blown away by the quality of the suggestions that I get from the Rust compiler. In many cases, I will just follow its instructions blindly, <laughs> you know, especially when I was first programming Rust, and they're like, okay, I'll try this, I'll add that uh, at symbol and mute, and then just see if that works. Oh, it works, okay, great. <laughs> and in fact, you can even make it, you can even make it fix itself, basically, if you want to auto-apply some things, you can make it, that happen. So I think compiler errors are a place where languages that are very simple, it doesn't matter a whole lot. But languages like Scala and Rust, which are very complex languages, it benefits tremendously to invest into really good error messages that tell you what went wrong, provide context, and then help you resolve that problem. And I think I, I've seen some very good error messages in Scala 3. Right, compared to some of the stuff in, two, in earlier two versions, so that's exciting, but I think there's always more we can do investing into the quality of our error messages. Another amazing, absolutely amazing feature of Rust that I think Scala can learn from is its build and package manage, management solution, which is called Cargo. Cargo bundles both the building with sort of package management. And it works on those very simple TOML files that you saw. And it has, inside this single command, uh, new and build and test and run and fix up your linting problems, install this or install this, update that dependency, publish something, view your dependencies as a tree, generate documentation, all of that stuff is baked in, you don't have to do anything and it all works incredibly well, and it's a super fast tool, just blazing fast. I've used a lot of build tools. I've been programming for more than 30 years, and I've used a lot of build tools over that span of time. I've never used a tool that I like. I actually like Cargo, I really like it. I have a pleasant experience using it. I'm happy to use Cargo, and I've never really had that experience with any build tool. It's like, okay, I'm gonna copy-paste some code I found on, or configuration I found on the internet in here and hope it works. And if it doesn't work, I'm gonna mash my keyboard until something ends up working. That's my normal attitude towards build tools. But really, Cargo is, is a joy to use. And it's just one tool that does everything you need based on a very simple file format, TOML, which despite all of its obvious drawbacks, is very tooling friendly, enormously tooling. All languages can read and write TOML. And there's no code in TOML, so they can programmatically change. And Cargo itself will programmatically go in and update 
your TOML file for you. It's just data. IDE. So we have entered, I think, an era where IDE is table stakes for a language. Tooling just keeps on getting better and better. And I've used Rust Analyzer, and I'm starting to play around with Rust Rover. Rust Rover is created by the JetBrains team, known for producing really world-class IDEs. And they're doing a really good job with Rust Rover. I think they're investing significantly. And then I've used Rust Analyzer, which works in VS Code, and it is rock solid. I've never been in a situation where a Rust Analyzer just flakes out on me or refuses to compile stuff, or it just, it's always working. I don't have to restart my machine or VS Code or kill all the Java process and blow away all the directories, all the stuff that you, that you have to do to keep metals alive. And, and right now, you know, at this point, I can't even use metals on my Windows machine with um, the Zeo project. It will not work, not for any period of time. It's just permanently, perpetually broken. And sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. And, and IDEA is good for Scala 2. It's not so great for Scala 3. We don't have a good IDE for Scala. And I think a good IDE is extremely important to attract that commercial software developer who's been using a, an IDE that's very, very good for Java or C Sharp or whatever. We want th that kind of developer using our language. Another really great thing is I think there's a lot of synergy between the language team at Rust and library teams outside Rust and in the broader ecosystem. And I think there's a lot of different examples of this kind of thing happening, but the one that sticks out in my mind is the relationship between async support in Rust and the fact that you need an async runtime like Tokyo or, or async STD in order to actually run your async code. And it would have been easy to imagine a world in which the Rust compiler team says, we are going to invent async await syntax, and we are going to build our own thing, and we're going to put all those other libraries out of business. It would have been easy for them to do that. They had to work to be not opinionated and to be collaborative with all those library authors out there who put in enormous amounts of time and energy creating big, powerful ecosystems. They had to work with them in a collaborative fashion to bring something that now gives users of Rust flexibility and allows innovation to happen in the library sphere, which it can happen, but also bakes some stuff into the language like the async await syntax. And there's, there's no such synergy happening in Scala, right? You know, the, the great stuff out there with Cat's Effect and Zio and Keo, all this other, you know, great innovation, that's a different world entirely from the world of Caprese. Also, I love the fact that Rust is truly first-class multi-platform. It works on all these platforms. You can have a Windows machine, a Mac machine, or whatever. You can also build for other platforms. It works on WebAssembly. I think we live in a multi-platform era. And I love that all the support for these different targets is actually built into the Rust compilers in the Rust repository. And over in the Scala world, we do have Scala native and we do have Scala JS, but they're more or less maintained by volunteers, you know, and they're downstream. They're not actually a part of the Scala compiler. I would love to see a world in which Scala says, yeah, we're going to commit to being multi-platform. And all that stuff we're going to pull into the main compiler, and we're going to refactor the core compiler to be multi-platform by default. That would be a very powerful world. Another thing, it may be too late, perhaps, for, for Scala to do anything about this, but basically the relationship between Rust and C is the same as the relationship between Scala and the JVM. But Rust made a different decision early on. And that decision is to say, we're not really going to be C compatible by default. You're going to have to opt in to your interop with C. And Scala made a different decision, which is, 
it's compatible with the JVM by default. And that's led to, I think, a number of issues over time that if we could rewind the clock, we, we might wanna say maybe interop with the JVM should be opt-in. An example of these issues are nulls, right? Scala really shouldn't have nulls. Or the discrepancy between a function and a method. Scala only has both of them because, really, it has both of them because of JVM, because the JVM treats them differently. Or uh, the fact that the JVM, the JDK, is actually so thoroughly integrated in Scala, the Scala standard library, that every time we support a new platform, we have to re-implement the JDK. All right, there are just some decisions here that are probably actively hurting Scala that result from the decision to have opt-out interop, I guess you would phrase that, whereas in the Rust world, it's opt-in. You're very explicit about that. So Rust, for example, doesn't give you any guarantees about how it lays structs out in memory and things like that. It gives it a lot of flexibility because it doesn't have to shoot for compatibility with C. It can do whatever it wants, and then if you want to interop with C, you can choose to make that explicit. And then this is one of the most amazing things in Rust, I think, is the fact that they launched 1.0 back in 2015. They've had 105 releases since then. And every one of them has been backward compatible. What does eight years of stability do? It allows a library ecosystem to grow and flourish. It allows tooling to get better and better and better and better. It allows books and videos to all stay relevant and to keep on teaching the Rust language as it is and was eight years ago. It allows you to invest, to grow, to build something that has a lot of value. And of course, when you don't do this, when you change things, you reset tooling, you reset educational material, you reset the library ecosystem, you reset everything, and maybe you end up making some improvement, but is that improvement worth it? Go back to the mathematician and the pragmatist. The mathematician would say yes. <laughs> the mathematician would always hit the reset button. But the pragmatist would say no. This stability, I think, pre 1.0, no one would touch Rust. No one wanted to go near this weird little language with borrow check. What is this language trying to do? But after 1.0, after stability set in, suddenly Microsoft is adopting Rust. Facebook is adopting Rust. Google, which bans Scala, is adopting Rust. Right? Big company after big company, X, AI, 100% Rust. It's making its way into some of the hottest and biggest tech companies in the world. Why? Because Microsoft knows that with this kind of track record, they can count on Rust to be stable. They can invest into it and know that that investment is going to remain secure over the next 10 years. And then finally, the last thing I want to talk about is Rust's winning value prop. But before I introduce you to Rust's winning value prop, I want to do a few other ones. JavaScript. What is JavaScript's value prop? Why, why, or when, I should say, when should you use JavaScript? Well, I think it's very simple. When you want to target the browser or some sort of on-demand environment, leverage a massive ecosystem, like, very few ecosystems are as massive as JavaScript, and you want to be able to hire like that. There's a million JavaScript engineers, there's a billion JavaScript libraries, and if you're doing browser work or on edge or serverless, it's JavaScript, right? That is a very clear value prop. Because a company can look at that and say, well, do I want that? If I don't want that, then I don't, I don't care about JavaScript. But if I do want that, I can't ignore that. You cannot ignore a winning value prop. 
at least the target market, cannot ignore a winning value prop. When should I use Python? This one's pretty straightforward. You want to do data or AI, right? If you want to do data or AI, why are you even thinking about a different language? But also, leverage this massive ecosystem and hire easily. It has similar benefits. There are languages that let you do data and AI, right? I'm thinking like, um, like R or the other one that was designed to, Julia, Julia and R, right? And both of them let you do ADA, data and AI, but they don't have the massive ecosystem and you can't hire easily. So this value prop, it really zooms in and this is Python's killer value proposition. If you have this problem, you have these pains, you can't ignore Python. When should you use Rust? Rust has a killer value prop, and it's when you want high performance and memory safety. Stability and tooling in a great ecosystem. So even that first part is enough to stand out. If you want high performance and memory safety, what are you looking at? You know, you know there's, there are some stuff in there. Rust is ahead of the pack by far. It is the clear leader in that space. There's like NIM and, and there's Zig and some other stuff, but like those are differentiated by Rust stability. Zig and NIM and the other ones out there, they're not stable and they don't have good tooling like Rust. And then the ecosystem in Rust is partially why we chose it. I think it's iVerge is all this WASM stuff, you know, fantastic WASM libraries, parser libraries, JSON library, all the stuff that you would ever want is in Rust. It's already been done before. When should I use Scala? I think we need to vote. Do you want to see the next slide or not? <laughs> yeah? <laughs> Are you brave? <laughs> I'm joking with this, but I'm joking for a good point. Okay, we can brainstorm on value props later, but for now, when should I use Scala? When you want to fuse OOP and FP, rewrite your code base every eight years and develop with Notepad. I'm joking. <laughs> but still, when I sit down, like I put my thinking cap on, I'm like, how can I sell Scala? If you look at the Scala website, it's all about fusing OOP and FP, right? That's, that's been the tagline of Scala for 15 years, we fuse OOP and FP. How do you sell Scala to an organization? What are the pains that are gonna force you to pick Scala? We looked at the other ones. So what I wanna do in wrapping up is talk about the anatomy of a winning value proposition and explain a bit about why I think it matters. First off, a winning value proposition is going to have a qualifying pain that is going to define the domain of potential businesses and use cases that it targets. And in the case of Rust, it's performance and memory safety. That's it, performance and memory safety. If you want both, you are in the target market for Rust. If you're in the target market though, that's not enough, right? Because there's other languages in any interesting, commercially interesting, target market, there's other languages in there. So you've got to differentiate yourself. And so you bring on some differentiators and the differentiators for Rust are very clear. Anything else in that bucket is either not as stable as Rust or it's got inferior tooling. And stability and tooling matter to what kind of developer? Not the hobbyist developer, the commercial developer nine to five, and also the big business, the engineering manager who wants his people to get stuff done. Tooling and stability matter a lot to those people and not at all to the hobbyists. So you're in the domain of, of performance and memory safety. People building fast systems, they want low cloud spend, they don't want runtime bugs blowing stuff up, so they're not gonna choose C or C++. They're gonna choose one of the safer languages that are still high speed and then you clear out the rest of those with the competitive differentiators. 
And so you, you kick Zig out, Zig doesn't have memory safety. You kick Nim out, doesn't have stability, or tooling for that matter. You just start kicking them out. And now you're at a point where if there's anyone else in there, right, you need a little something extra. And a little something extra in Rust's case is massive ecosystem. If anyone, I don't even think anyone survives that, those two first rounds, right? There's no one else in there with Rust, which is a good sign that it's got a, a solid lock on a commercially interesting target market. But then its bonus feature is large ecosystem. It's got a huge ecosystem. It's got libraries for everything. You don't need to write your own library to do anything you could ever want to do. Why does this matter? Why does the value prop matter? You might say, and many people have said, you know, Scala is great. All we need is a better tagline, right? A better marketing, marketing slogan. It is true that marketing matters. I'm not going to say marketing is irrelevant, because that's not true. Marketing does not matter as much as you think it does. Tesla does not advertise Teslas. But what's the number one electric vehicle company in the world? Tesla. ChatGPT does no advertising for ChatGPT. None. And within a couple of weeks, they had tens of millions of users, maybe hundreds of millions. Good product drives adoption. That said, marketing is important in noisy spaces to get noticed. Getting noticed is not enough. Because if you get yourself noticed and you're not ready to be noticed, then people will play around with it and then leave. And then you, you've burned that opportunity. Marketing is important, but it's not enough. So why does a value prop matter? It does matter for marketing purposes, OK? It matters that someone goes to Scala's web page and sees something and understands what this language is about and whether or not it's relevant for them. But it also matters for another even more important reason, way more important reason. A value prop provides a direction. It provides guidance. It is an arrow that is pointing in some direction. And that is extraordinarily useful. Because a language will evolve and tools will evolve. And stakeholders need to be able to look at proposed evolution and say, is this thing in or out? And if they're just doing it based on the way they feel, or based on who they're friends with, or whatever, that is going to produce something that is directionless and aimless. It's not going to go anywhere interesting. It's like, you know, a chicken without a head. It can still run around, but it's not going anywhere in particular. But an arrow, a value prop that's pointing in that direction, gives guidance. Once we know Scala is supposed to be up there, that's where Scala should be, then suddenly we can say, is this language feature the right one or not? Is this build tool the right one or not? Is this library the right one or is it not? If we don't have that, if we don't have an arrow pointing to that direction, then we're, we're never going to go anywhere. But if we do have that arrow, if we have that guidance, then we can make slow and steady progress over weeks and months and years and get into a better place a place where winning becomes possible. Rust has that, right? And I've seen some of the discussions, and they are dogmatic about it. If you propose some feature in Rust that's going to affect performance, <laughs> you will be shown the door immediately. That, that is a hard line for them. They will not negatively impact performance for any kind of feature you might propose. And libraries will kick that stuff out. Everyone's going to kick that stuff out. Right, if you uh, propose something that's going to affect memory safety, again, nope. So they've got that. And that helps Rust have an identity. We know what it means to be Rust. Rust has a purpose, a mission. And everyone can rally around that. And they can all move it forward into a singular, unified direction. And Scala right now has a bunch of people pointing in a bunch of different directions. 
but there is no, this is Scala, and we're all going to go here, and we're never gonna accept anything unless it's gonna get us closer to that direction. And that's the thing, I think, more than anything else, that Scala can get out of a winning value proposition. All right, so in summary, I think all programming languages can learn from each other. And you saw in this presentation how Scala can learn from Rust, but I want to assure you the other way around is true as well. Rust has plenty of things to learn from Scala. Don't think that you chose this talk, that dude, Thomas. <laughs> he chose this talk. Uh, Rust is quite close to Scala, I think, in many ways. They're brothers. And Rust is actually growing. It's growing fast. And there's a lot of activity. And it's worth taking a peek at what's going on over there because they're both complex languages with advanced compilers that attract a similar type of person. What's going on in there that's resulting in Rust just going up like that when Scala is having adoption issues in industry? And I think we can learn from Rust's weaknesses. I think Rust's weaknesses have a lesson in pragmatism to teach us. We've been overfeeding the mathematician. We need to put the mathematician on a diet and we need to start feeding that poor, starving pragmatist. And Rust's strengths have a lesson to tell us in terms of the focus that Rust has. All of these features that I love about Rust, they're all focused on that industry developer, that commercial software developer nine to five who's gotta get stuff done. They're all focused squarely around Rust's winning value proposition that is aligning the whole community in a single direction. And this audience here, as well as the broader one, I think, globally, is the future of Scala, right? You are, you are the future of Scala, all of you. And your, your feedback, I think, matters. And also, your own contributions how you teach Scala, how you share Scala, how you contribute to the future of this language. And I think one easy way to contribute is, uh, is working on that value prop, right? No one's quite figured out the value prop for Scala, and that's something anyone can contribute to. I know people have talked about that in the past. I think uh, Daniel from Rock the JVM, is he still here? No? He's worked on that. I know a number of people in the community have tried to figure out what, what is closest to what Scala already is that could become a winning value prop that could rally everyone behind it and give them a direction. I think that's a very obvious thing. But there's like marketing, obviously people can contribute to tooling. Uh, there's lots of tools to choose from. Some of them are trying to reinvent building tool. We have like Grandmaster from Pavel and, and Kai in the audience who are trying to give us a better build tool than, than SBT, satanic build tool, <laughs> as I like to think about it. Uh, so we have people working on better tooling for Scala. And if you're willing to roll up your sleeves and dive in, there's plenty of work for everyone. I think everyone can make a difference to the future of Scala. Thank you very much for attending my talk, and I hope to see many of you at the after party tonight. Thank you. <laughs>